Thank you, Father, for a new day. Thank you for your love that embraces us and touches us, revives us, God. We just come to you with open hands and open hearts and ask you to please touch us. And we worship you this morning, and we just love you, Jesus. Thank you for always meeting us. In your name, amen.
cast down the not destroy. I'm a vessel full of power. I've got a treasure from the Lord. Thank you, Father, for your power. It has resurrected me over painful circumstances that my poor soul could not. Lord, high and holy, meek and lowly, you have brought me to the valley of vision. Here in the darkness, show me your brightness, hemmed in by mountains. May I behold your glory. Let me learn that the way down is the way up. Let me learn that to be low is to be high. Let me learn that the broken heart is the healed heart. 
And the repenting soul finds joy. Lord, high and holy, meek and lowly, you have brought me to the valley of vision. Here in the darkness, show me your brightness. Hemmed in by mountains, may I behold your glory. Let me learn to have nothing is to possess all. Let me learn that to bear the cross is to wear the crown. Let me learn that to give is to receive. That the valley is the place of vision. in my poverty Father hear my cry You have brought me to the valley of vision Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we lift up Jeff to you. We pray that you fill his words with your word of life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So many of you have already heard that uh, we have hired a new youth pastor at our church. And Daniel Perez has um, just recently come on staff. And we're so excited about him and what lies ahead for him. He's um, Following up, Sam Ellis is eight years of fantastic youth ministry at our church, but, um, but in the in-between time, we've had kind of a special year. And as you know, um, coming after Sam Taylor stepped into that role and for a few months did such a great job of kind of rallying our youth group, but then had some health complications. And I remember in that moment feeling a sense of, um, what are we going to do? And I think of, during that time of prayer, how God so profoundly answered that with this young woman here, Ricky Farns, 
who said I would be willing to step in to that gap. And uh, my first reaction to that, Ricky, I think just as a pastor was enormous relief because I was sitting there in the midst of that predicament going, what are we going to do? Who's going to take care of our kids? Um, So I love just your courage to step in there. I think as a father having two kids in the youth group, I've been so blessed by what they actually got this year from Ricky. And Ricky is an incredible teacher. She has a deep heart, but this incredible presence that just makes those kids feel so welcomed and that they belong. And you gave that to my kids, and that's such a huge gift. And I think lastly, I I think as somebody who um, appreciates leadership and the difficulty of it, I am just impressed by how well you handled that group. Um, Ricky has enormous character, and the way that you came in and so gently cast vision and direction for these kids, and I think you've left Daniel with an enormous gift and direction in what you've done there. And as her time in this transition role comes to an end, I just want to tell you how thankful I am. Ricky was a sixth grader in my very last year as youth pastor here at the church, and so I've known her for so long. But to see her rise in um, stepping into her talents and into her calling has been so fun. And she's been pursuing a a degree in teaching and a credential and is hoping to step into that phase um, coming up here soon. And we just want to bless you as you go. But before we do, I just want you to have a chance if you'd like to share anything with us. Sure. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Yeah, I'd like to thank, first of all, um, all the support that I have had this year. Um, definitely the kids, they've been amazing. And despite all the challenges this year, they were just so ready to step in um, and just walk through them. And so it was such a great experience getting to do that with them. Um, And then also the parents, we had a lot of parent support, again, despite kind of a lot of changes. Um, They were just really quick and ready to ask how they could help or step in. Um, And that also leads me to think about all the families that volunteered to bring food for our leaders throughout the year this year and signed up for those leader dinners. Um, Also our interns, we had three high school interns this year and so um, they really worked to step in and and roll with the punches, all the different changes. Um, We're really committed to keeping up with that and seeing it through till the end. Um, And I'd like to thank also just the regular volunteers, um, all those adults that came and helped on Tuesday night um, and at other events we did. We still got to go to Forest Home this year, which was so much fun. Um, So thank you especially to everybody who helped make that happen. Um, And yeah, I guess I would just say that um, it was unexpected, but such a blessing, Um, something that I'll definitely take with me. Um, I know moving on from here. Uh, I just feel really thankful that I got to spend this year uh, with the kids and um, just all the amazing questions they had and the positive outlook um, they had throughout all the changes that this year brought uh, was just really inspiring. And so, um, yeah, I'll continue to be praying for them as I move on from here and for uh, the whole youth ministry at Church by the Sea and just feel, again, really blessed to have been a part of it this year. Let me pray. I'd love to bless you. God, thank you for your servant, Ricky. God, I thank you for the anointing that you've put on her as a teacher. God, also the anointing that you've put on her as a pastor. And God, I thank you for these passions and these gifts. And God, I pray that as she's entering into this next stage, God, that who she is would continue to flourish and to grow. God, we pray for opportunity that you would put before her. God, thank you that um, she has been so faithful this year. And we pray you would reward her for that faithfulness. God, we send her and bless her with full hearts, God, knowing that the way in front of her you know and you have made straight. So God, bless she and Greg, bless their marriage. God, bless their vocations as they step into this next phase. God, keep them here and connected at our church and um, flourishing in this community. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Happy Sunday. I hope you guys had a good week since we saw you last. Um, Same announcements as always. Number one, please send your prayer requests to prayer at lagunaefc.org. I feel like I had a new wave of 
overwhelm and anxiety this week over all the things going on. So I definitely have prayer requests. Please send in your prayer requests. Um, also, remember to check out the website, littlechurchbythesea.org, for any information that you need in order to connect in any way. You can also give there um, under the Give tab. You can also give on Venmo at Church by the Sea. As always, thank you. Thank you for being faithful to doing that. Um, the other thing is we have our Be the Bridge um, meeting finally tomorrow, Monday night at 8 o'clock via Zoom. Please go on to the church website littlechurchbythesea.org, and click on the Be the Bridge button. It's on, the, it's on the homepage, straight out in front of you. It's the first thing that's there. Click on that and put in your email because that's how you're going to get the email for our Zoom meeting, okay? I'm not going to post it on Instagram or anything. I'll probably tell you, go to the website and put your name in there. Um, Anyway, so make sure you do that. We're going to talk through the first three chapters of the book, Be the Bridge, by Latasha Morrison. You are all invited. We are really excited to step into this work of reconciliation with all of God's people as a church. So um, do that. And uh, I'm really excited about that meeting. So, and the final thing that I was thinking about is I was reading in my Bible this morning, um, Genesis chapter 6 through 9, and it's all about the flood. And you guys... In this story, Noah and his family are on that ark for almost a year, and it is all starts and stops. It's like rains like crazy for 40 days, and then for 150 days, they're just floating, and then they land on a rock, but they still can't see any land, so it's two and a half more months before they can even see the tops of mountains, and then they start sending out the birds, and they don't find anything, and they have to wait seven more days, and they have to wait seven more days, and then they have to wait two and a half more months. It is all starts and stops, and it felt so incredibly familiar <laughs> to what we're all going through right now. So my point is, as I was just reading, I felt like it was a reminder that this is not surprising to God. God has been here. God has taken his people through all kinds of crazy things in the history of humanity. So I was actually given a little bit of solace by that and thought, please don't make this last a whole year. <laughs> Anyways, um, so maybe that's an encouragement to you. It was an encouragement to me. So not the first time God's been through something like this, um, and he can bring us all through. So that's what I've got for you today. Let's pray for Jeff as he comes and gives us the word, and what an awesome psalm he's teaching us through today. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the reminders that you are with us and that you are for us and that you are taking us all the places you want us to go, God. And I just pray for your sustenance, and I pray for your mercy, and I pray for your courage, and I pray for... Ah, your presence. And um, God, the watchman waiting for the morning was a part of our psalm last week, and it continues to be in this week's psalm. And I know some of us are in that really calm and confident space of waiting, knowing your faithfulness, knowing you're coming, and others of us are desperately waiting for the morning. And so we are watching hard. And so, God, I pray for both of those situations that you would hold us near that we would know that you are with us, that we are not walking these roads alone, and that we have you, and we have each other, and uh, we have your word. And so I pray, God, as Jeff brings us your word this morning, that it would be filled with your heart and your um, insight and your inspiration, and that it would transform us, our hearts and our minds. And uh, we just thank you for this opportunity to come together like this every Sunday morning. Amen. Well, good morning. Today, we're on the 12th Psalm in our series, going through the Psalms of Ascent. And I remember, you know, this series, as we were going into quarantine, it felt like an opportunity. We knew we were on a journey um, for us to do some theology, some deep heart work as we were traveling through kind of this unknown season of quarantine. And here, as we're nearing the end, I think, Deep down, I was hoping that we were going to be on the other side of this by the time we finished, and I'm not quite sure how that's all going to pan out. I was jokingly saying that um, maybe after this we'll do the prison letters of Paul. Um, we, all of us are adjusting. All of us are getting used to this. But um, what I love about last week's psalm and this week's psalm is a common theme, and it's that of hope. And hope to me feels like something we so desperately need and are struggling um, to hold on to. But the psalm last week and the psalm this week are linked by a common line that we would put our hope in the Lord. And the context of last week's psalm was somebody drowning. 
They were being overwhelmed. They found themselves in the depths. And that's felt consistent with what it feels like emotionally we are experiencing. I think of so much of what we see and what we hear, the anxiety or the anger, these different things all point to a deeper sort of heart grieving that is going on. And I think I've felt this last couple of weeks a sense of collective sadness. But as we're moving through it, we find that this is again opportunity. Opportunity for us to grow in our hearts. Opportunity for us to see in new ways. An opportunity for us to experience God on undiscovered levels of intimacy. And we would assume that God in His love would put us in a place of comfort so that we could remain there. But instead what we find is a God who joins us in that place of suffering and experiences with us the sorrow and brings the light of his intimacy, his said we talked about last week, his steadfast love into that place of vulnerability. And so we see new sides of God when we walk through these places of suffering. And we find an assignment there in our last psalm that we like watchmen await the day, that we long for a word from the Lord. We long for that glimpse of the salvation and redemption which is to come. And so we wait and we endure. And like James says, we build in our hearts perseverance. Today's psalm is going to cast further light on the intimacy that comes in this place of vulnerability and of hope. And it's only three verses, uh, the second shortest in all the psalms. It may be small, but it's strong. Spurgeon called this psalm one of the shortest to read and the longest to understand. And to grasp the gift of the intimacy in the midst of this is also a part of our maturity as we grow spiritually. And as we experience what is at the heart of this psalm, it begins to change who we are. It shapes our life. It gives us the strength <clears throat> to remain so let me read the psalm for us, Psalm 131, three verses, um, and you can read along with me. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And the psalm today begins with a posturing. It talks about the heart. It talks about the eyes. It talks about our mind and our thoughts. And we see that with each of these three, that we see what the psalmist is not doing. I think this is interesting. You know, it reminds me a bit of 1 Corinthians 13, where when Paul describes love, he spends most of his time talking about what love isn't. And I think this idea of, um, of what something is described by what we are not doing is demonstrating a sort of natural tendency on our part to go the other way of where we're intended to go. That there's a sort of struggle going on underneath this. There's a gravity that pulls us in a certain way. And what we see here in this psalm is there's a gravity that pulls us toward pride, towards insecurity, towards anxiety, towards arrogance. This is the natural gravity of where the world pulls us. And so the watchfulness has this sense of resistance to it. And with each one of these three, with the heart, with the eyes, with the mind, there's a, a demonstration of will to resist. Resist where that gravity goes. I, I like how Simone Weil says that the only thing in this world that resists the gravitational pull of worldliness is grace. And for us, this is what we're doing is we are resisting the pull of sin 
which draws us to this place of independence from God and instead leaning in to the adversity that we might overcome and on the other side of it experience intimacy. So the psalmist says that his heart is not lifted up. His heart is not proud. And this word for pride, interestingly enough, is this value-neutral term. In fact, in Isaiah, it talks about God's servants being lifted high. But it also says in Proverbs 16.5 that the heart that is lifted high is an abomination. And you could feel like there's a sense of contradiction here, but I think this isn't true. And I think this is part of the mysterious nature of Scripture, that it draws us into the deeper mysteries when we see paradox. But it seems to be all about this idea of releasing control. And you think about what we've studied up until now. We have to let the Lord build the house. Otherwise, we labor in vain. And I think in a similar way, when we elevate our vision, when we find ourselves looking high, there's an independent texture to this. It's our time. This is our way. When instead, what God is asking is that we would be lifted high in His time and in His way. I think of this going all the way back to the garden. You think about the original sin of man. And it was to eat from this fruit in our timing. And it was a way of claiming a sort of independence from God. And this tendency that we see there in Adam and Eve, we find just as well alive in our hearts today. We want to take the fruit and eat it when we feel like we are ready. In a similar way, we want to take the glory and achieve it on our own so that we might hold on to the value and prove our worth. Similarly, he says his eyes aren't raised too high. So not only is his heart not lifted up, but his eyes are not raised too high. And there's some redundancy in this. I think like poetry, it will say it and then it will say it again from a little different angle, a little different slant. But I think that both of these dimensions play into each other. The heart, the desires of the will, and also the eyes, what we set our gaze upon. These things are so interconnected that the treasures of our hearts are so often shamed by what are shaped by what we view. And so what we pay attention to, what we look to, become the longings of our hearts. I think this graphic image of Lot's wife turning back towards Sodom, looking with a longing at what they were leaving behind. And what we turn our gaze to has a huge um, implication on who we're becoming. And so what we find is the, the, the psalmist being careful where he sets his eyes. I think of that song we used to sing back in vacation Bible school days. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. And the psalmist, he's not like seeking after glory in his heart. He's not setting his eyes on his own achievement. He's lowering his gaze. And I think so often when I look at what I am seeking as I find myself scrolling through social media, as I find myself reading or looking, or what am I looking for? So often when I scroll through a social media feed, if I answer that question, I find that I'm looking for peace. I'm looking for good news. So I'm scrolling through the news articles. I'm looking for something that's going to come in in comfort, when in fact all it does is attack my comfort. When I scroll through pictures of others, I'm looking for ways of feeling connected and belonging. And so often what I get as I scroll through is feelings of insecurity, jealousy, fear of missing out. So often what we set our gaze on is looking to fill these deep, soulful needs of the heart. And we go looking in all the wrong places and only cause a deeper and deeper pit within us. Some of the drowning, I think, that we experience is, is our own doing based on what we set our hearts and our minds on, what our gaze is set upon. 
The psalmist refuses to concern himself with great matters. And I think this is so interesting. Uh, to, to concern himself is actually literally in the Hebrew to walk. And I think here we're brought back into the metaphor of the pilgrimage. The psalms, these uh, psalms of ascent are sung on a journey. And here we find the psalmist talking about the paths that he walks. He's not walking paths too great for himself. And this idea of how we walk, where we set our mind, the journeys that we take in our own heads. And here he's talking about great and wondrous things. And it's interesting here too, we see something that isn't in itself wrong. That God has in mind for each one of us glory. And that God has done things, I think in each one of our lives, we would consider great and wondrous. So why is he not setting his mind on it? And I think what you have to see here is, again, the strategic thinking of how we try to recreate these experiences or hold on to things of the past. Or we try to figure out the depths of who God is, to have all the answers and everything figured out. And interestingly, that desire for certainty is so often instead a desire for control, not that we shouldn't have deep deep confidence in the knowledge that we have of God. But the desire to have things figured out, so often that's a way of us instead feeling right and feeling secure. And it's a false sort of security. It's not deep enough. I like how Chesterton says, the poet only asks to get his head into the heavens. It is the logician who seeks to get the heavens into his head and it is his head that splits. Chesterton there elsewhere says it's the chess players that go insane, not the artists. But I like this idea that the mysteries of who God is, I think sometimes we can obsess over these things and try to have everything figured out when instead there's this posture of open-handed acceptance. We come to the ends and to the limits of our ability to know and figure out And this is like life itself. This is, I love how you see this in physics all over. The physicist Niels Bohr said, the sign of a deep truth is that its opposite is also true. And you see paradox after paradox in science, paradox after paradox in theology. And I think what this gets at is that we have knowledge that surpasses knowledge. This is how Paul is going to refer to God's love always beyond our comprehension, always drawing us further and further in. And so rather than try to have all the answers figured out ahead of time, what we see again is the discipline to instead move to this place of quieting his soul. Why? So he can experience intimacy. I think that when we try to have it all figured out, so often we're trying to find ourselves deserving of a sort of love or making ourselves worthy. But when we experience the intimacy of God, what we find is there in our brokenness, the sufficiency of God's love. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Gosh, isn't that what we long for so much to just be in that place of grace and God's sufficiency to rest right there. That is the place of hope. That is the thing that our hearts crave. In verse two, we see the waters calm. He's calmed and quieted his soul. And this word is literally to be still, to be quiet. In fact, to be silent. So often it's in this place of silence alone where we are able to hear those whispers of God. And silence itself, we find, is a choice. And it's a difficult choice. I've quoted this so many times, but I love Pascal saying that this is where all men's problems stem from, his inability to sit quietly in a room by himself. But the reason is 
The silence reveals the turbulence within us. The anxiety and fear is so clearly seen. But the truth is, this anxiety and fear within us is not contained, even though we would like to think so. It's spilling out of us. I often think in a moment of such unrest, what the world needs now is the church. But what it needs is a church that is filled with peace and hope. And while we make speak those words so often, the texture of how we speak reveals the deep anxiety within us. And the psalmist is speaking right to us, saying, what are you setting your heart on? What are you setting your mind on? What are you fixing your gaze upon? Instead, let the waters calm within your hearts by being still and knowing that he is God. Psalm 1 David talks about meditating day and night on God's word. It says, this is the way that we thrive and we prosper. We become like a tree planted by the water. And this idea of meditation, I think sometimes we've been so afraid of the word just because we've seen its misuses, but the meditation, the digesting of the words of God in this place of stillness is not just a practice that like might be helpful I think it's something that we're deeply neglecting in the church and we see the effects of it. That a quieting, that a prayerfulness, that a contemplative period of our day is crucial for every single one of us. There's so many ways that we can do this to meditate on God's word. One of my favorite ways is what's called a breath prayer. And a breath prayer is just a way of taking a verse or a truth from Scripture and just letting it breathe in and out. Some have said that even the name of God is a breath prayer. That there's a yaw and a way that comes in the breath. And that breathing and that restfulness, the stillness, as we draw in God's promise and truth, One of my favorite breath prayers is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When I feel anxiety, when I feel my heart rate increase, when I feel worried, when I find myself spiraling, when I find myself in the depths, to come back to these prayers and to let my soul be stilled. And right here in the midst of this psalm, in the middle of it, we get one of the best pictures of what this looks like. A weaned child at his mother's breast. And this is a picture of rest. This child in his mother's arms. I I think of my little niece, Addie, who's darling, but always gets a little shy when she sees you for the first time, and especially when she's just woken up from a nap. And I come up and say, hi, Addie. And she just clings to my sister with like all her strength. That's Addie in my sister's arms, but not restful and at peace. I think sometimes that is our sort of clinging to God like help, and I think that's a great image of what God invites us to, but there's more. This is a child that's asleep. And weaned, people have talked about that. What is a weaned child? And some have theorized that maybe that's a child that is full. All its needs have been met. And it can just lay in that place of trust and acceptance in God's arms. And I like that image. I think that that's true. I I remember as we were going through Psalm 23, when it would talk about a shepherd leading his sheep to green pastures, letting his sheep sleep, lie down in green pastures or walk beside still waters. We get this picture of a lamb that has been cared for It's full and can then rest. So this place of the sufficiency of God, filling every sort of need, allowing us to enter into this place of vulnerability where we can close our eyes and let go of control. And sleep is one of the most beautiful images of trust because I think when we sleep, we are so vulnerable. When we sleep, that part of our mind that's constantly spinning is disengaged and it detaches. 
And I think we all know what it's like when we can't sleep, when the worries of our day keep spinning over and over through our head and we get stuck in the worst case scenarios or the what ifs or the things that we can't control. There's another psalm, a psalm of David, Psalm 3, that he writes at one of the most distressing periods of his time, of his life, where his son has betrayed him and taken control of the city of Jerusalem. And David, rather than going to battle, leaves. And he writes this psalm, and I'm just going to read it for you. In Psalm 3, he says, For you strike, oh, save, sorry, save me, oh my God. For you strike all um, my enemies, O Lord, how many are my hosts. Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there's no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, strike my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. And that psalm is David working through this major crisis. And as he's working through that, as he's fighting against the deep emotional distress, what we see in this chiastic structure is not only has he received God's salvation by the end, but in the middle of it is this period of sleep. In the middle, he lays down and sleeps. And again, I think this is a clue for us that I think so often we think, God, get us through this. Get us to the other side of this. God, get us back to the way it was. God, when are you going to do this? When are you going to have mercy and restore life back to previous comfort? But the gift, I think, of a time like this is God saying, look, I want to give you sleep. I want to give you peace right in the middle of it that it's available right there, hope, right there, trust, right there in the distress. And as you find yourself in your own heart wrestling, in your own heart struggling, how can we enter into this practice? I think this is what the psalmist is casting vision for us for, how to quiet our soul and enter into that place of rest. And I like how David sleeps, but then God comes and raises him up and he finds himself sustained, that God is enough. And this truth, no matter what you are facing, no matter what the fears are, no matter how uncertain the future, you have a God who promises he will sustain you and be with you and join you. In the psalm last week, we see the cry for mercy. And by the end of the psalm, nothing has changed circumstantially for the psalmist. He's still waiting. And yet what he experiences in that place is what he calls the steadfast love of God. And as we look for an image of the steadfast love of God, what we see is that child in his mother's arms. And a weaned child can also mean a child that's a little bit older a child that has been weaned. In fact, for the Israelites, they would have a, an age for this at the age of three, and they would even have a ceremony and a feast for that child that had been weaned. A child who is no longer living in that place of dependency on his mother, but instead could just simply enjoy being in the presence and comfort of his mother's love. And I think this is part of the glimpse that we see here as we think about our own spiritual growth and maturity. I think so often we're trying to act like adults when what we're being told instead is you just need to be a weaned child. Or maybe we stay in that infant stage, like Paul is saying, like you're still drinking milk when you should be eating meat. That there's a growth, and I don't think we ever leave this childlike place with God, but maybe what we do is we reach a place where instead of clinging to God for the milk. Instead, we're able to just enjoy his presence. 
I love how the image of God in this psalm is so feminine because I think that often this side of God gets missed by us. And we know this from the story in Genesis of creation that male and female are made to give us a a window into the heart of God and his character. That God is neither male nor female, but instead a combination of the two in love. And so we see throughout Scripture, symbols, metaphors that reveal these sides of who God is. And certainly we embrace the idea of God as our Father, our Abba Father. But here we see this beautiful glimpse of God as a mother holding us to his breast, holding us to her breast with compassion. In fact, the the psalm is written to where this is literally saying, like God the child at my breast. And many have thought that this is possibly a psalm written by a woman, possibly a woman that is traveling, carrying her child. And so the intimacy is matched but also by the strength of this mother holding and carrying her child on this journey. And this shouldn't surprise us. Women throughout Scripture would write beautiful prayers of such de- depth. I think of prayers from Miriam or from Hannah. And Mary's Magnificat is one of the most beautiful, I think, of all. In Isaiah 49, 15, God says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. And God chooses this image of the loving parent, this father or this mother that come alongside and care for this little child. This is a place that we never, I think, mature beyond. That we find ourselves there in this place of being nurtured and protected and cared for. This is where we stay. And yet we do grow in our independent striving to do things our way, but also in this insecurity that doesn't allow us to move forward. That God wants us to grow larger, more mature, more like Christ, but to also stay humble. I remember a time where I feel like I experienced this kind of mothering side of God's character. And like all revelation in my life, it hit me out of nowhere. I think this helps me see it, right? It it reassures me with a bit of a skeptical mind uh, that this is not just something that I've wished for. And I was um, doing like a, a quiet day and I needed it. I was exhausted, but I think sort of my introverted side just wanted my own sort of alone time. But we were given an assignment to walk this prayer labyrinth, and if you've seen one of these, are these just beautiful circular mazes that you kind of walk through from beginning to the middle and then back out, and it's meant to slow you down. I don't know if you know this. This is why monks like walk with their hands behind their back. It slows them down as they pray. So they're doing something with intentionality, but they also uh, want to slow down their pace and not hurry. And so I was given this as a um, kind of an exercise for the day, and, um, and I didn't want to do it. In fact, I resisted it all the way to the end where I was almost out of time. And then I said, okay, I'm going to do it. I was sitting under this like beautiful tree out there. And I thought, I just want to stay here. But I, you know, I, I went and I, I came to the labyrinth and, um, and it was beautiful. It had this tree at the very center. It was just kind of gorgeous. But as I kind of reluctantly entered and started walking through this labyrinth, I felt that texture. And um, this is something that has only happened to me a few times in life, but this sense of like God's manifest presence. Because God is with us at all times, but then there's other times where he's near, right? It, It means something different, and I felt that. And as I walked, I just felt the refreshment of that, just the gift of that presence. And as I was walking, I, I started hearing what sounded like singing. And of course, I like opened my eyes and was looking around like, where's that coming from? And I was all by myself. And so I just closed my eyes and kept walking and was listening to the singing. And it sounded like a woman singing. And as we walked further in, I felt like I heard laughter. 
And then I just heard my name several times in that same feminine voice saying, Jeff, with such delight. I've never shared that story publicly. And I I think part of it is it just was such a personal gift to me. And I saw this deep compassion. I think that so often with my father, I want to make him proud. I want to rise to you know the, his level of expectation. And there was something so sweet in the gift of delight that God was just so pleased to be with me and near me. When I think about that child on his mother's chest just resting there, I was kind of jokingly saying this to somebody the other day, that I I would love when my kids were little, when they would have a fever because they would just want to like lay with you and instead of moving around so much. And that picture, not only what this is as a gift to us, but I think is a gift to God. It gets at the heart of why we were made that God takes such delight in this moment of intimacy. It fills God's heart with a deep sense of joy. Augustine says there can be only two basic loves, the love of God unto the, un, unto the forgetfulness of self, or the love of self unto the forgetfulness and denial of God. And I think that gaze that's being lowered, right? The, the, the love of self is diminishing in its humility. And as that gaze is lifted towards God, we find ourselves forgetting ourselves and instead entering into the freedom of intimacy, this oneness with God. And I say all of that because I think this so much so, is what we need. This is what we're looking for, what we're searching for. And when we find that place of intimacy, we hold on to that truth. That is the hesed. That is God's love. And when you've experienced that, you hold it through the night. You look forward with hope. And I love how it's going to say here, it's this hope that endures. He says, now and forevermore, we'll hope in the Lord. We know how much we are God's beloved. It sets all things at ease. All is going to be made well. And so we can remain in that place now. It's here now in the midst of quarantine, in the midst of pandemic, in the midst of all of this, that hope is here now, that love is here now. But now and forevermore. In other words, taking our image from last Sunday of a watchman, we're ready to wait. How long? As long as it takes. That becomes the strength. That becomes the endurance. This is what it means to live a life greater than this world. We watch and pray. How long? Now and forevermore. We'll stay in this place anticipating God's good and redemption that is to come. And as we live in this place, God sustains us. God is that river that brings life to this tree and allows us to bear fruit. But we have to enter in. We have to lower our gaze. We have to stop spiraling about things too complicated for us. We enter into that place of deep trust, and when we do, we find God is enough. I have some questions, and then I have a a couple how-tos with this. Because hear me in this, that um, you can take and hear this, even understand this, but, but to not follow through with this is to not see the effect that it's a participation, it's a posture, heart, eyes, mind. We enter into this. But question one is, what is the state of the waters of your heart? Sometimes we're not even asking ourselves that. All we see is our secondary emotions and we don't drop back into 
How are we doing here? What's the state of the waters of your heart? And what is creating disturbance and disruption? What are you afraid of? What are you saddened by? What feels overwhelming or is creating anxiety? How can you practice letting go of that control? How can you practice a Sabbath rest? We need this. We need to take a day where we just rest. Maybe today can be a bit of a Sabbath for you. Maybe you can find a window of time to be still, to stop doing, and to just be. And is there a verse or even a word that you could sit with as you pray to practice this kind of breath prayer of being in God's presence? Listening, watching. How do we practice this posture? Number one, we discipline our hearts and minds to disengage from figuring everything out. Realize when enough is enough. This idea, are we supposed to just put our head in the ground? No. Are we supposed to stay uninformed? No. Are we supposed to learn and grow from information and knowledge? Yes. But we need to know when we're saturated. And usually what comes with that is something more on an emotive level. As you read, be aware of the state of your heart. Know when you've had enough and take a break. And as you do, we quiet our souls through a meditating on God's word. And the breathing in all of this is just a way of like physically entering into this, but we set our minds on these deep truths and we let them sink down. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. These become digested in us. And as we eat, they become part of who we are, part of who we think, to, how we think. Number three, we remain in stillness and quiet until the water of our heart is quieted. And to remain there can feel uncomfortable and maybe you take it in short little steps. My goodness, just to sit for 10 minutes. I remember one time with the women's group that I used to lead at our church years ago, I, I had them do 10 minutes of silence. And when we opened our eyes, one lady at the table just with tears in her eyes said, I feel like I heard more from God in those last 10 minutes than in the last 10 years. And sometimes it's just we don't carve out the space. And number four, as you watch and you pray, be listening for God to speak. That God does speak words today, words that bring vision and salvation and redemption that bring purpose and meaning. God does speak today. And when he does, it anchors us. And it doesn't always happen. There's no formula. You don't get to kind of go through the motions and that gives you a word from God. But God, in his perfect timing, knows just when to speak, just when to lift our heads, just when to bring that light. And know this, that as you practice this, it's hard and difficult and, um, you know, it, it's okay. Brennan Manning, he, he says that it's like a child sitting in the lap of his parent, that even if he's distracted, the parent finds himself just happy to have that child in his lap and that this is what it's like when we come into this place of prayer with God. He says, Jesus is saying that we may address the infinite, transcendent, almighty God with the intimacy, familiarity, and unshaken trust that a 16-month-old baby has sitting on his father's lap, daddy. And as we're told to pray, Abba, Father, again, that picture of intimacy. So today, as we go to the Lord's table, and we pray, prepare our hearts for communion, I thought we would take just a little bit at the beginning of this song and sit with a passage of scripture. One that I find so profoundly true from Isaiah 30, verse 15, where he says, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. 
in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. And as Chris plays, we're going to keep those words up there on the screen. I just would ask that those would be a prayer for you today. That you would let the truth of those words sink in. That God would sustain you, fill you, and be your strength. Amen. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of our God. The holy dwelling place of the most high. For we won't live in fear, though the earth should quake. As the time grows near, we have a loving God. Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and after giving thanks he broke it and said this is my body broken for you do this in remembrance of me and in the same way he took the cup saying this cup represents the shed blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of our dwelling place of the most high. Therefore we won't live in fear, though the earth should quake. As the time
May God bless you and keep you. May God make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And may God lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. God bless you. Thanks for being with us today.